But what I want to do now is to turn to the uh, doctrine that matter is unconscious. This is a particularly important doctrine for mechanistic science because it dates right back to its foundations. The key revolution in the scientific revolution of the 17th century was the shift from an organic view of nature to a machine view of nature. It was a revolution because it rejected what people thought before. And what people thought before uh, was a philosophy of nature taught in the medieval universities of Europe based on Aristotle as refined by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century. And it was a very sophisticated philosophy of nature. According to Aristotle and St. Thomas, all living beings had souls. And the soul of a living being was not some metaphysical thing to do with life after death. It was what gave it its form, its structure. The body was in the soul. The soul was not in the body. And the soul gave each kind of plant its form, its leaves, its flowers, its roots, its shape. And, and the soul worked by attraction. As the tree grew, it was attracted towards the mature form by the soul of the plant. It was like the form. Um, in addition, animals had, as well as the vegetative soul that shaped their embryos and growth of the body and maintained its health, there was the animal soul, uh, which was concerned with instincts, sensations, and movements. And, of course, the word animal comes from the Latin word for soul, anima. Um, human beings had a vegetative soul that shaped the body, an animal soul that gave us our animal nature, our senses and instincts, and so on, are very similar to those of animals. But in addition, the rational or intellectual soul to do with reason, language, uh, the mind, consciousness. But nobody thought that the human mind uh, was totally separate from the rest of nature. It was embedded in a psychic system which connected us to animals and plants. And the whole world was alive. The earth was alive. Uh, the planets were alive. We still call them by the names of the Roman gods and goddesses. And the stars were alive. They were intelligent beings. So when a medieval person looked at the sky, they looked at a living universe filled with the presence of God. Every star was a living, intelligent being. Now, the mechanistic revolution replaced that with the idea that everything's a machine. The organic view of the Middle Ages was really a form of Christian animism. Plants and animals had their own purposes, their own desires. The soul gave them their motivation, their goal. The whole of nature had a purpose. Uh, it was striving towards the being of God, striving towards perfection. God was the prime mover of the universe, not by pushing it from behind, but by attracting it from the future. Um, that view was destroyed and replaced by a machine view. The heavens became dead matter. Uh, the um, solar system became a mechanical clockwork-like system. Uh, animals and plants became mere machines with no feelings, so it was all right to vivisect them or treat them appallingly in factory farms. Uh, the only thing that was left that wasn't mechanical in the world was the human rational mind. And that was the only thing left, uh, except for angels and God, which were immaterial spirits like the human mind. This was Descartes' view, and it created an extreme dualism of body and soul, matter and spirit. Um, so for Descartes, the whole world was mechanical, made of unconscious matter. Consciousness existed only in humans, angels and God and was separate from the rest of nature by being immaterial, not in space and time. This created a radical dualism between people and animals, mind and body, and between religion and science, because science got the realm of spirit, human minds, angels, and God, and, re and science got, uh, religion got that, and science got the whole of the physical universe, including the stars and the heavens, which now became dead, unconscious, and inanimate. <clears throat> well, that was the revolution, and matter, in this view, was defined as unconscious. No one did experiments to accurate to many places of decimals. It was simply defined as unconscious by Descartes, and it's remained so ever since uh, in the view of scientists, without further discussion. And dualism, um, th th this view that it's too many, uh, meant that they tried to collapse it into one of these two principles. The idealist said everything is consciousness, Matter's just a kind of dulled down uh, spirit or consciousness or mind. Um, but the more popular view was the materialist view. Everything's matter. There's no such thing as this mysterious non-material spirit of the human mind, and certainly not angels and God. So at one stroke, the materialist wiped out angels and God and said the human mind is nothing but the activity of the brain. They collapsed it down 
in, into the brain. And that is the view that took over science by the late 19th century and has been the standard paradigm ever since. Of course, it creates appalling problems, and one of them is that it makes human consciousness inexplicable. If matter's unconscious, how come we are conscious? Um, well, some philosophers of mine, materialist philosophers, uh, say, well, there's a simple solution to that. We're not conscious. The mind is just an illusion. We're just machines. That's called eliminative materialism. And in the United States, throughout much of the 20th century, the official doctrine of uh, academic psychology was behaviorism, which denied the existence of consciousness. It said the only thing you can measure objectively and scientifically are muscular movements and glandular secretions. And that's what scientific psychology should study, ignoring the folk belief in consciousness. Others take the view that consciousness is nothing but an epiphenomenon, a bit like a shadow of the acti activity of the brain that does nothing. Um, and others take the view that consciousness is an illusion produced by the brain to make us feel good. None of these views say that consciousness does anything. We don't have free will. Uh, it doesn't actually do anything useful. Uh, it might just as well not be there. We might just as well be zombies or robots. Uh, and it's irrelevant to science because it doesn't really exist. The trouble is that this isn't a very convincing view, even for materialists. I mean, they'll argue it at work, but as soon as they get home in the evening, they don't treat their spouses, their children, and their dogs as if they're inanimate machines. And they themselves don't believe that they're materialists because their brain makes them believe it. Um, they like to think they're materialists because they believe in science, reason, and evidence. Um, and uh, yet their entire philosophical position undermines its, uh, their belief, their, their, their belief in materialism. It's incoherent. That doesn't stop it being the dominant philosophy in all our universities and in almost all philosophy departments. Uh, it's the dominant view. But it's so incoherent and so difficult to square with observable facts that within consciousness studies, uh, this is now very, very much disputed. There's been a breaking away from materialism by leading philosophers. One of the first to break away was Galen Strawson, a British philosopher who lives in America, who wrote a key paper a few years ago called Does Materialism Imply Panpsychism? To which he answered yes. Panpsychism is the idea that there's a kind of mental aspect to all kinds of nature, even electrons. Um, and although he didn't give any details, he said this was the only coherent way we could explain the emergence of consciousness in humans. Because if you try and conjure it out of totally unconscious matter, it's really just reinventing dualism on a kind of evolutionary basis. More interestingly, and, uh, and I think more coherently, the American philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote a book a few months ago, which I think is a breakthrough in modern philosophy. Nagel is a leading philosopher of mind in New York. And his book is called Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. His book was hated by the uh, m m materialist uh, militant atheist crowd. He was denounced, denounced as going off the rails and that kind of thing. But it's a deeply thoughtful and fascinating book. But of course, panpsychism is not new as a philosophy. It's what people thought in the Middle Ages, basically. And um, in the 17th century, soon after Descartes, in the next generation of philosophers, people were already exploring this possibility. One of them was Leibniz. And Leibniz argued that the universe is made up of monads, units of organization, including us, but also including atoms, um, and that every monad, as well as having a body, has a mind, and each monad reflects the universe from its own point of view. So every monad has a completely different point of view because it's in a different place. Like everyone in this room has a different point of view because we're all in different places. We can't all be in the same place at the same time because bodies are impenetrable. Um, and so uh, that was one panpsychist view. Another was Spinoza, who said that the whole of nature is the body of God and, and it has a consciousness or mind, the whole of nature. It's God or nature. It, it was a kind of pantheistic view. The most important philosopher in this tradition in the 20th century was Alfred North Whitehead. And Whitehead argued that um, all physical systems uh, that are self-organizing uh, have a mental aspect. 
Self-organizing is a key here. This doesn't apply to chairs, tables, motor cars, and so on. They're not organized. They're put together by an external force, humans. But things that organize themselves include atoms, molecules, crystals, um, cells, animals, plants, ecosystems, planets, solar systems, and galaxies. Those are self-organizing systems. And Whitehead argued that all self-organizing systems are processes in time. There's no such thing as enduring matter like little billiard balls. He was the first philosopher to appreciate the importance of quantum theory. And what quantum theory shows is that even electrons are waves. They're waves, uh, wave-like patterns of activity. They're processes, not things. And if they're processes, they take time. You can't have a wave at an instant. That's the fundamental reason for quantum uncertainty. You can't have an instantaneous wave at an exact moment of time, because a wave takes time. That means a wave has a future pole and a past pole. It's a process. And his philosophy is called process philosophy. Um, and so even an electron has a future and a past pole. And Whitehead's most original contribution, in my view, was the way he understood the relation of mind and body. Usually people think of it in terms of spatial metaphors. The mind is the inner life, the body is the outer world, or, or the, uh, the outer part. Uh, it's the inner and outer. He thought the relationship was a temporal relationship. The mind is the future pole, the body is the past pole. In an electron, the Schrodinger wave equation describes all the possible things that electron could do. Those possibilities coexist. They're not physical, material, measurable realities because they're possibilities, a different kind of thing. Uh, but as soon as the electron interacts with something or is measured, then these possibilities collapse down to one physical observable fact. Uh, that's now in the past. The physical pole is in the past. And now a whole new realm of possibilities develop. The same with our conscious minds. They're, co they're filled with coexisting possibilities. Our minds are realms of possibility. Mental reality is a realm of possibility about p potential futures, virtual futures, things we could do. And our minds are involved in choosing among these possibilities. As soon as we choose to do something and do it, it becomes an observable physical fact, objectively measurable. But before that, it's a possibility. And this gives a view of causation, a twofold form of causation, uh, possibility, mental causation, working from virtual futures towards the past, and regular physical causation working from the past towards the future, and they overlap in the present. I think this is the best way of thinking of the relation of mind and body, the most fruitful. Um, it has many implications, and I don't have time to go into them all now uh, at this moment. What I do want to do is just explore what this panpsychist view might mean when we look at big things. Most discussions of it are about atoms and electrons. But since we're here at the Electric Universe Conference, what about thinking about the sun and the galaxy? The sun is a self-organizing system. Indeed, the whole solar system is a self-organizing system. It's not put together in a factory. It organizes itself. And the entire galaxy is a self-organizing system. From that point of view, they're organisms. And from Whitehead's point of view, that would mean they would have a mental pole, which did, would be to do with potential futures, and a physical pole, uh, depending on the decisions or choices made among those possible futures. Uh, what we observe is the physical pole. Um, but they have a great deal of indeterminate activity going in, on in them, particularly electrical activity, electromagnetic activity. We know there's no dispute that the sun is highly active electromagnetically. However one interprets the source of its energy, everybody agrees that this highly complex electromagnetic patterns are going on there. People also think that the interface between our brains and our minds are the complex electromagnetic patterns going on inside our uh, brains. So what if these electrical patterns in the sun are an interface with the sun's mind? What if the sun thinks? Now, as soon as you raise that question, you realize this is an utterly taboo subject. You're not allowed to ask that question. It's matters unconscious. Since the 17th century, uh, materialists have assumed, and dualists, had assumed that matters unconscious. It's simply off limits. 